We still don't know enough codes yet to write a complete program. So in this lesson, we'll learn a few more codes, relatively simple ones, but nonetheless, they'll help us to write a complete program. Every program begins with a program label. The program label code is the letter O. Sometimes you'll see the character colon used for this purpose as well. The program label would consist of the letter O, or the colon character, followed by a four-digit number. Notice that this is a whole number and no decimal points are allowed. At the end of the program would be the M30 command. The M30 is the program end or program stop command. This command will also rewind and reset the memory of the control so that it can run another cycle. So therefore, each program will begin with the letter O and it will end with an M30. Here you can take a look at a complete program. It begins with a program label, O 1997, calls up tool 1 with offset 1, T0101, turns on the spindle at 220 surface feet per minute in the forward rotation, G96, S220, M03, rapids to an X position of 1.35 inches and a Z position of 0.1 to the right of program 0, and turns on the coolant with the command GOO, X1.35, Z.1, and M08. The next line, G01, Z0, F.005, feeds the tool to Z0 at a feed rate of 5 thousandths per revolution. The next command, X minus .03, would be a facing cut, moving the tool down the front of the workpiece. G00, X 1.25 Z.05 moves the tool up to a diameter of 1.25 inches and the tool to the right of the face of the part at a Z position of 0.05. G01 Z minus 0.875 takes a turning cut along the diameter of the part to a length of 0.875. The next command X 1.35 will feed off of the workpiece to a diameter of 1.35. G00 Z.1 M09 will wrap the tool back to the front of the workpiece and turn the coolant off. G28 U0 W0 will zero return the tool in both the X and Z axes and it will send them to the home position. And finally, the program ends with an M30. Each line in the program really should have its own unique name, just as each program would have its own unique name using the O word. For the lines in our program, we can use the N word, which specifies a line label. You will notice in the example program below that the O word does not have a line number nor does the M30. The O word should always be on a line by itself or if there is something on that same line it should be in what are called parentheses. We'll talk about those a little bit later. The M30 can have a line number but oftentimes you'll see it on a line by itself. This is just a programming style and it adds to clarity for that M30 command. When selecting line numbers you can count by ones, or if you go on to the next page, you could count by fives, or you can count by tens. It really doesn't matter which numbering sequence you use. The whole purpose of the line labels is to help you organize your program. There are times when we need the machine to stop for certain things. During setup, you may want to stop the machine between each tool so that you can check the size of the part before allowing the machine to go on to the next tool. Doing it this way, the setup person can almost always get the first part correctly on size. Also during production, there are times when you may need the machine to stop for some manual function. Depending on the situation, sometimes you may need the machine to stop optionally, and in other cases you need it to stop every time. 
For an optional stop, we have an optional stop command, M01. On the operator panel of the machine, you will look for a switch called optional stop. When that switch is turned on and the command M01 is executed, the machine will stop execution. This allows a setup person or an operator to open the door of the machine and check on something. If the switch is turned off and an M01 command is executed, nothing happens. It is basically just skipped over. In the example program shown here, you can see the M01 command on line number 110, just before the tool change command calling up tool number 2. If the optional stop switch is turned on and this program is running, when it comes to line number 110, the machine will stop and that allows the setup person to go into the machine and check the workpiece. Let's watch this program run through its entirety. At the end of the cycle, the machine will stop. If you want to run the cycle again, just click on the cycle start button below. Notice also that the optional stop is shown as off. On the next screen, we'll turn the optional stop on and provide you with an opportunity to see how the machine would run in that situation. Notice when this cycle runs, the tool will come in, turn and face the workpiece, and then the turret will go back to the home position and just stop. If you click on the cycle start button, the program will then be allowed to continue on past that M01 command. Run it through a few times so that you get the hang of it. The M00 command is a program stop command. It is used anywhere within the cycle to stop the machine for a manual operation. Some examples would be a flip job. A flip job is a part where you run the first and second operation consecutively. After first running the first operation, the machine would stop at the M00 command. You would then take the part out, flip it around end for end, put it back in the chuck, and then run the second operation. This is a good program example to study. This program example will show a turning tool coming in and facing off the part and turning it, which we've seen many times so far. Then tool number two, which is a drill, will come in and drill the workpiece. We haven't seen a program example of this yet. Finally, tool number three is a tap. You will notice that for a tapping operation, we have to start out the spindle in forward rotation, as noted on line number 200. Then we rapid the part to X0 and Z of 0.25. The next command, G01, Z minus 0.625 at a feed rate of 0.0833 is how we feed the tap into the workpiece. Let's learn about a few more commands here that are very, very helpful, but their name is a little bit odd. These commands are called the control in and control out commands. Here is a program showing the minimal use of these comment characters. Notice that on the program label line, there is the comment characters with the part number and a revision number in it. This is a good place for that. If you use these comment characters on the program label line, when you do a directory or a library listing on the CNC control, the information in those comments will show up with the program label. This is helpful to set up people and operators. Now that we have enough codes to write a complete program, let's see how they have to be assembled into one complete program. A complete program can be broken down into basically five units. Program start, which begins a program, Tool start, which begins each tool. The cutting information, which is what you create for each machining operation that you need to perform with each tool. Tool ending information. And finally, program end. The program start section of your program, of course, will contain the program label. Also in here will be any descriptive data that you need to include that covers the program, such as the part number, the revision, 
the date the program was written, and perhaps the programmer's name. Your company will probably have many other requirements for this area of the program with regard to comments. Another command that can fit into this area of your program would be the G50S command. That is a modal command that would continue throughout the entire duration of the program. Thus, this is a good place to put that command. Sometimes you will see it included just for one specific tool, but any tool prior to that would not be covered by the G50S command. So therefore, the beginning of the program is truly the best place for your G50S command so that you can override the maximum RPM of the machine for the entire run of the program. The tool startup part of your program performs all of the necessary tasks to call up the tool, get the spindle running at the proper speed for machining that part, getting the tool into position for cutting, and turning on the coolant and any other accessories that need to be activated. You will notice that in the tool startup section, we are not actually machining the workpiece. We are only getting the tool into position. The cutting section of your program requires all of the codes necessary to completely machine the workpiece for this particular process and with this particular tool. Even if the feed rate is the same from the previous tool, you should still program it within this code section. Remember, you want each tool to be thought of as its own unique little program. The tool ending section of your program performs all of the tasks necessary to get the tool away from the part to a safe place where the turret can be indexed to any tool, not just the next tool, to turn off the coolant if necessary or the spindle if necessary, and to provide an optional stopping point so that the setup person can stop the machine at this point and check the machining operation that was just performed with this tool. In many programs, the program ending section will consist of only an M30, and that is really all that is required to end the actual program. Now let's take a look at a complete program so that we can see clearly each of the program units. In this example, you can see that the program start information is shown in black text. Below that, starting with tool 1, there is the descriptive data for tool 1. On line number 10, we call up tool 1 with offset 1. Line number 20, we turn on the spindle with constant surface speed at 220 SFM. And line number 30, positions the tool so that it is ready for cutting and turns on the coolant. Beginning at line number 40 and continuing up to line number 80 is the cutting information for tool number 1. Line numbers 90 through 110 are the tool ending information for tool number 1. Each tool must begin with tool startup information and end with tool ending information. Moving on to tool number 2, you will see that beginning at line number 120 through 140, these lines are nearly identical to line numbers 10 through 30, with different speeds and different tool numbers, but the general information is the same. We call up the tool, we turn on the spindle at the proper speed, and we get the tool into position for cutting. Line number 150 is our cutting information for that tool. Very minimal, as it is only a drilling operation. The tool ending information, which is almost identical to the ending information for tool number one, simply brings the tool out to the front of the part, zero returns the axes, and program stops the machine so that we can add tapping compound to the tap before we allow it to tap. Notice the subtle difference between the program ending information for tool number 2 versus tool number 1. On tool number 1, on line number 110, we have an optional stop command. For tool number 2, on line number 180, we have the program stop command. Moving Here we can take a look at two different program startup units. A simple one would include just simply the program label, 
and perhaps some descriptive data about the program. A more enhanced version might include a program label, as it must be, more elaborate descriptive data, a G50 S1200 with a comment stating that it should be adjusted per run, and then finally some additional codes, G20, G40, and G99. These are Here we can see two different tool startup program units. First one for geometry offsets and the second one is for a G50 style program. Tool ending information varies greatly from machine to machine and from company to company. You will notice that for our simple tool end for geometry offsets, we simply wrap the tool to in front of the workpiece and turn off the coolant. We then send the tool to the home position using G28U0W0 and finally provide the optional stop command M01. The tool ending units shown below are basically identical to the previous ones, only we've included the tool offset canceling codes. If you remember, to cancel a tool offset, we call up the tool with offset 0. So here we are showing calling up tool 1 with offset 0, and that would cancel both the wear and the geometry offsets. Now, depending on the way your machine is configured through the parameters, you may or may not need to turn off or cancel your tool offsets. As mentioned earlier, the program end portion of your program is usually quite minimal. In this example, we're showing a simple program end, which basically consists of an M30. This may at times be preceded with an M09 command, turning off the coolant. And keep in mind, we can only have one M code per line, so the M09 would be on the previous line of the M30. As demonstrated in the previous example, that slash code is called the block skip. The block skip feature works with the block skip switch located on the operator panel. When the switch is on, all of the program information after the slash code on that line will be skipped over. Yep, time for another quiz. X13750 will be interpreted as X1.3750, M01 is called optional block skip, program stop, or optional program stop. The N word is used to give each program a unique name, give each line a unique name, give each line a unique name, and control execution order. The control in and control out characters are which of the following? The S word should not have a decimal point or have a decimal point. The main purpose for M99 is to end a subprogram, end a main program, or call a sub. The O word is used to give each line a unique name, control the order of which program runs first, or the MOO command stops the program when a switch is on, ends the program, if block skip is on and a slash code is programmed, the machine will skip through a program for testing purposes, will skip commands after the code on a program line. M30 is used to end a main program, end a sub program. Okay, so you've made it through another quiz. Take a moment. Let's take a few minutes to introduce you to Toolnose Radius Compensation, a very powerful feature that can save you hours and hours of manual calculations. When we are writing our program, we are treating the tool as if it had an actual sharp point on it. 
but as you may know, all tools have a radius on them. If the tools were ground to a sharp point, that point would probably break off very quickly when cutting the first workpiece. Therefore, all carbide insert tooling has a radius on it. Now most of the radii that are on these inserts are in the range of 15 thousandths to 31 thousandths. However, in special circumstances, this radius can be as small as 3 thousandths of an inch, all the way up to 3 eighths of an inch, and even larger on big equipment. To illustrate to you the difference between programming the theoretical sharp point of the tool and the radius of the tool, watch this animation run. Now keep in mind, we are always programming and positioning that sharp point of the tool. I want you to watch closely to see what part of that radius on the insert is actually coming into contact with the workpiece. As you watch this animation again, what we have done was highlighted the area on the workpiece that is not being cut by the radius of the insert. Now you must understand tool nose radius compensation cannot cure this problem. This is strictly a limitation of the tool. The With this animation you can clearly see the difference in positioning between having tool nose radius compensation turned on and off. To run this animation click one of the gray buttons below either labeled TNRC off for tool nose radius compensation off or TNRC on. Run these several times until you see the difference in positioning of the tool. When tool nose radius compensation is turned off, you will notice that as the tool cuts along this chamfer, the radius portion of the tool never actually contacts the workpiece. This would mean that our chamfer would be smaller than what is required. There would be too much material left on the workpiece. But the theoretical sharp point is going right along our program path. Now when we turn tool nose radius compensation on, the tool will be shifted. All of the program commands will be shifted to accommodate for that void between the programmed point of the tool and the radius of the tool. Watch again several times on this animation. We will also show you on the next slide how this affects the machining of a radius. Here again you have the opportunity to run this animation with tool nose radius compensation turned off and with tool nose radius compensation turned on. Run it several times and again look to see where the programmed point of the tool, that theoretical sharp point of the tool, See where that follows along your programmed path, which would show up on the animation as the finished shape of this part. Now when tool nose radius compensation is turned off, the theoretical sharp point of the tool follows right along the shape of the part, which means anywhere along that radius we would not have cut enough material. When tool nose radius compensation is turned on, you will see that as the tool is machining that radius, the theoretical sharp point of that tool is shifted inside the boundary of the finish shape of the part. Again, tool nose radius compensation is compensating for that radius on the insert and the difference between that radius and the theoretical sharp point of the tool. Here again, watch two different animations, one with tool nose radius compensation off and the other with tool nose radius compensation turned on. What you should see is that both tool paths are identical. Tool nose radius compensation does not shift the programmed path when we are machining on a single axis only movement. To help you see this a little bit more clearly, look closely at this diagram. You will see that there is a blue shaded area coming from the theoretical sharp point of the tool back towards the radius of the insert. That is what tool nose radius compensation is actually compensating for. Not all tools and machining operations require the use of tool nose radius compensation. 
The purpose for tool nose radius compensation is to ensure the accuracy of the workpiece when we are machining a taper, a chamfer, or a radius. Thus, it is really not important to use it in roughing operations. It would serve no purpose as the roughing operation, when used without tool nose radius compensation, would leave extra material for us to machine with the finishing tool. Now that extra amount of material would only amount to a few thousandths of an inch, so it is truly not very critical. By now you probably understand why we need tool nose radius compensation. Now let's take a look at how we program it. Believe it or not, as powerful as this feature is, there are really only three codes that you need to learn. The G40 code turns off tool nose radius compensation. It is a modal command. The G41 command turns on tool nose radius compensation when the tool is to the left of our programmed path. G42 turns on tool nose radius compensation when the tool is to the right of our programmed path. The trick to understanding the difference between G41, tool nose radius compensation left, and G42, tool nose radius compensation right, is understanding how the tool is approaching the workpiece. If we watch this animation run through several times, you can start to get the understanding of it. Here we are showing you a finish turning operation on this workpiece. Notice how the tool comes into the front of the workpiece and moves along the outside diameter of the part. The second time the animation runs, the part will disappear and just the programmed path will show up. Now look in the direction of that programmed path, as indicated by the arrow at the end of it, and look to see which side the tool is on. If you are looking in the direction of the path, or in other words the direction of cut, you will see that the tool is on the right hand side of that path. Now let's take a look at how that code would fit into the program. Below you'll watch the animation run, but at the same time try and follow along with the program. You will see that on line number 25 there is a command G42. That is turning on tool nose radius compensation. Now tool nose radius compensation is modal, so we really only need to turn it on at the beginning of the contour. Then it remains active all the way through the finish turning operation. On line number 65, when the tool is moving away from the part along the X axis, we are turning tool nose radius compensation off. When we turn the tool nose radius compensation on with either G41 or G42, we call this the approach move. We are approaching the workpiece but not actually machining it. When we are turning off tool nose radius compensation with the G40 code, we are moving away from the workpiece. This movement we call the escape movement. And again, we are not cutting the actual workpiece during this movement. Here again you can see that same animation. This time I've moved the program path away from the workpiece so things are a little bit more clear. Here you can clearly see the approach move and the escape move. Now what you must understand, the approach move is only on the Z axis and the escape move is only a movement along the X axis. Now what you want to do whenever turning on tool nose radius compensation or turning it off you really only want to move one of the two axes during that motion. It doesn't matter which axes, but you only want to move one of them. Another important aspect of the approach and escape is the distance the tool will travel. The tool must travel greater than the radius of the insert. On this particular machining operation, we are doing a finish boring operation. Again, we are going to use tool nose radius compensation but this time we have to turn it on with G41. If you look closely and watch the animation, you will see as the tool is cutting the workpiece, the tool is actually on the left side of the programmed path. 
Watch as the animation runs through the second time and we will only show you a red line representing the programmed path. And notice that the tool is on the left of that line as we look in the direction of cut, which is in indicated by a red arrow. Here you can see within the program for this tool that on line number 105, which reads G01, G41, Z0, F.0035, is where we're going to turn on tool nose radius compensation left. On line number 140, we are going to turn off tool nose radius compensation with the command G01, G40, X.875. Here is the complete program showing you the turning operation and the boring operation. On line number 25, we turned on tool nose radius compensation right with the G42 command. During that motion, we were not cutting the workpiece and we would be moving a distance greater than the radius of the tool. I can tell this by looking at the previous line and the Z position there was 0.1. So to feed from Z of 0.1 to Z0 would have been a hundred thousandths of an inch movement, definitely greater than the radius of the tool we're using for this. On line number 65, you can see that we're moving away from the workpiece along the x-axis, moving to a larger diameter, and we are turning off our tool nose radius compensation with the G40 command. Now look on the previous line to this, line number 60. That was a z-axis movement. Because that was a z-axis movement, I know that line number 65 should be an x-axis movement when we turn off the tool nose radius compensation. Going on to tool number 3, you can see in line number 105, we turn on tool nose radius compensation left for this boring operation. You will see that the G41 command is used and you will see that again we are traveling a distance greater than the radius of the tool because the previous line was at Z of 0.1 and we are moving to Z0. Again, a hundred thousandths of an inch movement which is going to be greater than the radius of our insert. Going back to line number 140, you will see that Again, we are going to cancel tool nose radius compensation using the G40 command and we are going to move to a smaller diameter on x-axis so as not to hit the finished bore. The distance that we are going to move there is basically a 50 thousandths or so. We need to move smaller from the x.9375 diameter smaller to the 0.875 dimension. You might want to back up rerun these animations and watch these tools and how they react to the workpiece and you may want to see how the basic motions occur. The approach and escape moves are very critical. If you follow the basic rules they are going to work for you reliably time and time again. What we would like to show you now is how the tools can be applied to the workpiece different ways. Here we are looking at a boring operation. A normal boring operation would occur when the tool is machining from the front of the part towards the back of the part. In that particular situation, the tool would be in a G41 situation. This would be considered a button tool or sometimes they are referred to as a neutral or profiling tool. These tools are very universal in that they can cut efficiently either going to the left or to the right. Now if this tool were moving towards the left as in a normal finish boring operation, it would be a G41 position. If the tool were moving to the right as in a back boring situation, the tool would be to the right of the program path, meaning that we would need to program G42. Here you can see a back boring operation with a back boring bar. You can see the sharp hook angle on the insert which allows it to cut very effectively when it is pulling out of a bore. However, this tool, as with all others, can go in either direction. If we were to utilize it as in a normal boring situation, it would be a G41. If we are to use it as it is designed in back boring, where we are going from inside the hole coming out toward the front, 
its application would be G42. For, although this may look rather impossible using a button tool or a profiling tool on the back face of the workpiece, there are certain machines that allow machining in this position. Here you can see a back turning operation. A back turning operation would refer to the tool cutting from the back of the part towards the front of the part. However, if the tool were moving towards the back of the part, it would be a G42 situation. If the tool is moving towards the front of the part, the tool would be in a G41 situation. Here we can see that profiling tool that we showed you on the bore and on the back face being used on the diameter of the workpiece. Here again is another profiling tool, this time applied to the front face of the workpiece. Now let's get back to a little bit more about the application of tool nose radius compensation. You will see that in our previous examples we turned on tool nose radius compensation at the beginning of our contour and then turned it off at the end of the contour. Now in those two examples that was for the entire cutting operation of that tool. What I want you to look at on this particular slide is see how the tool comes in and performs a facing operation, then makes a rapid positioning move to position the tool properly to come in and finish turn the part. Now as mentioned earlier, we really don't need to have tool nose radius compensation turned on for a straight facing cut because we're only moving one axis, the x axis. However, when we are turning the rest of this workpiece, we would be making two combination moves, one to cut the chamfer at the front of the part, and then there is a taper midpoint along the turn. There we definitely need our tool nose radius compensation turned up. Another problem that could arise while you are programming this particular part is that if you look closely, when the tool is taking the facing cut, the tool would be in a G41 situation. Then as the tool repositions to take the turning cut, during that turning cut, it would be in a G42 position. To handle this, because it is such a common problem, because we take a turning tool and we will often face the part first and then come in and perform our finished turning operation, I've demonstrated to you in this program how this is handled. And it is truly quite simple and elegant. What we will do between lines numbers 10 and line number 30, we'll have our tool startup information positioning the tool ready for the facing cut. Line number 40 moves the tool over to Z0. Line number 50 faces the part off. And notice that when we face the part off in this example, we are going to a position of X minus 0.03. This is actually very proper. You want to feed past the center line of the spindle when doing a facing cut. That eliminates the little nib that is sometimes left on the center line of the part. Line number 60 is a rapid positioning move to bring the tool up into position so that our next movement, which is our tool nose radius compensation approach movement, is positioned properly. Notice that the Z.1 gets us 100 thousandths away from the front of the part. On line number 70, where we feed up to Z0, which is the face of the part, we will have a distance traveled of a hundred thousandths, which would definitely be greater than the radius of the insert used for this turning operation. Then the tool would continue along its path all the way up to line number 120, where we are feeding off of the part, turning off our tool nose radius compensation with the G40 command. What you want to study here is how that the facing operation was performed without tool nose radius compensation. When using tool nose radius compensation, the offset screen is affected as well. Let's learn about that in this lesson. When tool nose radius compensation is programmed, we must tell the control what the radius is of the insert for each tool that uses tool nose radius compensation, and we need to tell it what type of tool it is. On the Here we can see the geometry offset page. It looks just like the wear offset page except for at the top it's labeled with geometry. 
The values we would put in here, of course, for the x and z would be the distance from the program zero position to the tip of the tool while it is at home position. The r and t values would hold the radius of the insert, and t, of course, would represent the tool type. The R column on the offset page refers to the tool's radius. The tool's radius can be any size. However, inserts are made to several standard sizes. The sizing standard is based on how many 1 64ths of an inch the radius is. If you look at a box of inserts, you will see some numbers similar to this, CNMG 432. The last digit, 2 in this example, means that the tool's radius is 2 64ths of an inch, which means that the tool radius is 0.0312, or basically 1 32nd of an inch, which is 2 64ths. The control will also need to know the tool type. The tool type lets the control know which way to shift the tool's position during those movements where we are moving x and z axes at the same time. This diagram represents all eight different tool types. The most common tool types are two and three. Type three is your standard turning tool. That would be used, of course, for any front turning operations where the tool cuts from the front of the workpiece towards the back of the workpiece. The tool type number two is your boring tool. It is a standard boring bar for standard boring operations where we cut from the front of the part towards the back of the part, but on the inside as opposed to the outside. As mentioned earlier, this information is input into the offset page by the setup person during the setup. However, in the program, it is sometimes helpful to include information such as the recommended tool radius and the tool type within comments inside the program. The importance of these R and T values is critical. If they are input incorrectly, your workpiece will not be machined to exacting standards. If the R value is incorrect, the tool will shift too far in either direction. If the T value is incorrect, the tool will shift the wrong way. In either case, our radii on the workpiece and all angles will not be machined correctly. Now you need to know how much you learned about tool nose radius compensation. Tool nose radius compensation allows you to cut an inside radius smaller than the tool radius. True or false? G41 is tool nose radius compensation, left. The programmer must enter the R and T values into the where offset page, geometry offset. During the approach, you would command G40 to cancel tool nose radius compensation. G02, a turning tool would be type 1, 2, or th with the G50 method of programming, the setup person must enter the R and T values on the where offset page, enter the R and T values into the... Pro During the G41 or G42 move, the tool will not move at all, may make an unexpected movement, cut a perfect angle every time. When programming, you position the tool relative to the theoretical sharp point, or rel tool nose radius compensation actually compensates for the tool's radius, the gap be for G41 or G42, you must see if the tool is to the left or right of the part of the program path. Okay, so you've made it through another quiz. Take a moment and look at the evaluation number